Hi, Gunner. Good afternoon, Dylan. So I first heard about you when I read your research paper on the theory of positive reinforcement being unscientific pseudoscience, <laughs> which uh, is an extremely controversial position, to say the least, in the biological community. So what was your journey uh, that led you to that conclusion? Yeah, so it, it kind of started all with... Um, me coming from a different perspective, I guess, from a from the average person entering this field. So I, I moved to Tahoe after um, undergraduate. I, I had completed a biology major and a piano performance major, and I just needed a break. So I went to Tahoe to ski, and I actually became a professional skier. And as I was doing that, I was like, you know what, I, I really want to go back to grad school um, this is getting too dangerous. Um, so what can I do? And I found a lab that was working on the development of the brain um, with uh, fruit flies, of all things. And the fruit flies, I didn't realize how intelligent flies were until I started getting into this field. Like, they actually learn things. They have somewhat of a social structure. They do courtship behavior. Um, so, so these really simple organisms had much more complexity than, than I realized, and I wanted to do behavior with them. And so my professor said, hey, why don't you take this class from this guy named Alan Gardner? Well, it turns out Alan Gardner was the guy that um, did the Washoe Project. Now, Project Washoe was where they cross-fostered chimpanzees as if they were humans. They taught them sign language, they, they raised them in a sign language home um, to try to see what the difference was between, you know, a human child being war raised as a human and what would happen if you have a chimpanzee child raised as a human, right? That was the whole goal of the project, just to see how similar they would be. <clears throat> and through this class, I learned like, oh wait, so if you actually go and look at the way learning is happening, um, None of the experiments, or very few of them, turn out the way that you expected. And, and if you go clear back to like the turn of the century, even, um, there were these people like uh, Harvey Carr wrote a paper in 1914 that said, hey, um, E.L. Thorndike's uh, theory about satisfaction, um, guess what? That's circular logic. How do you, how do you demonstrate uh, satisfaction independent of um, the, the methods that they were using. And it got me thinking, I was like, well, okay, so, so you got this problem with Thorndike. What about Skinner? What about reinforcement? And so I started reading through that literature and, and found out that it's, it's basically the same thing um, as the, the law of effect that Thorndike came up with. And when you look at the actual experiments, there isn't a single control group. <laughs> They start with the assumption, I guess, that, it, that learning has to happen by a certain way or, or whatever it is. And they just go through an experiment of like a rat pressing a lever and then see if you give it different amounts of food or different ways of giving it food, what happens to the number of lever presses. Um, but what about, what about the other, what, what about everything else in the world? What about the context? What about the, the fact that people don't always do what, what they're expected to do when you just give them food, right? So um, I can go through some details, but, so, but basically I started seeing all these problems with the outcomes of the experiment versus what reinforcement said should happen. And I found the misbehavior um, paper from 1961, Breland and Breland, and, and it documented all these different species that they did the wrong thing when you gave them food. Right. Um, so, so that was kind of my introduction to it. And so then I started looking from a molecular level uh, on the dopamine. So dopamine at the time was really considered to be the reward molecule that was carrying the signal of reinforcement. And it turned out that the, the molecular um, evidence didn't line up uh, the same either. So, so really it was a, 
about me reading the literature first and saying like, okay, if reinforcement happened by rewarding a behavior, then what should the outcome be? And seeing that it differ it diverged quite frequently. So in your paper, you describe reinforcement as a reinforcing stimulus following a behavior makes it more likely that the behavior will occur again in the future. I think that's all familiar to us. Um, and then uh, you challenge this by saying, if the stimulus was a reinforcer, it will in increase the previous behavior. How does one determine if the stimulus was a re reinforcer? It increased the behavior. What process increased the behavior? Reinforcement. If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Reinforcement is a textbook example of circular logic. Circular logic is not falsifiable and therefore cannot be a basic principle of behavior. Now, um, Pinker, Stephen Pinker, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, uh, he has, uh, he said that the, I, I reached out to him about um, your paper. And Pinker said that that argument was debunked at least 50 years ago. What you're saying. <laughs> um, I do. <laughs> he, he, now he said, uh, let me see here. He said, I was familiar with that argument when I was an undergrad in the 1970s. It's an empirical issue whether any reinforcers exist. For my car, there are none. And once you identify what the primary reinforcers for an organism are, food and sex, as long as they are a subset of all stimuli, the circle is broken. <laughs> no, you can't just say the circle is broken without demonstrating it, right? So, so the, the problem I have with that is, is this. Okay, so uh, aside from circular logic, let's say that um, it is true that food is a reinforcer. So food must come after a behavior to make that behavior increase, correct? Right. Otherwise, it's not a reinforcer. Well, with lever pressing, guess what happens if you just throw food in the dish without a requirement of the rat doing anything? And there's a lever next to it. So if the rat's just sitting there or scratching or whatever it's doing, let's say it's scratching. Let's say it's scratching, food comes. Shouldn't food reinforce scratching? Right. Right? If it's just sitting, shouldn't food reinforce sitting? So when you actually video these rats and see what happens when you just deliver food at an interval, you see that lever pressing increases even if they weren't lever pressing before the food appeared. So this is, it seems like completely counterintuitive, right? Like why on earth would that happen? Well, you have to look at the rat's behavior, uh, ethology, which is its natural behavior. Rats handle their food. So when food comes, that is a stimulus to handle. So what's the nearest handling looking object next to the food happens to be a lever that looks a lot like the type of thing that a rat would handle to eat. So when you drop in food, the food activates lever pressing, food handling behaviors. It doesn't reward them. So it's the wrong direction. Does that make sense? Yes. So the, when you try to reinforce scratching or tail twitching, there is not a single publication that I've been able to find that has been able to demonstrate that you can reward a non-food related behavior with food. So if it were reinforcing, as said, you should be able to increase these other types of behaviors by just delivering it right after it happened. But I, I've never been able to do it myself and I've never seen a publication that's demonstrated that. If positive reinforcement can teach an animal to do something, to learn something new, the question is how come different kinds of animals are taught to do different things? You've, you've um, talked about this a little bit. So pigeons, yeah. so pigeons are, in experiments, pigeons are usually taught to peck at targets, not levers. Um, mm -hmm. For pigs, it's coins. 
for rats, as you said, it's levers. Well, why not, if positive reinforcement theory is true, why not use a lever for every animal? There must be something innate going on, right? Yeah, yeah. So that that's definitely part of my argument is that um, if it is such a general principle, why, why is there such um, tight constraints about what they will learn? And why do they learn so easily in some situations and so difficult? Is it, why is it so difficult to train them in others? And it has to do with how well that stimulus matched with their ethology. And that's independent of whether or not it's reinforcing. So, so yeah, some people make the con concession that, okay, well, yeah, you, you have to know which reinforcer for which behavior, but that really weakens the argument already of like, okay, well, if it's a general term, then why do you have to know what the right reinforcer is for the right behavior? And then you have to actually demonstrate that it goes the right direction, that if you don't just give it at intervals, no matter what they're doing, uh, that the same behavior won't appear. Yeah, I As, asked, uh -huh, yeah. go ahead. Um, compared to, you know, if you did it only after that behavior you're trying to reinforce. So how do you falsify the idea of reinforcement? Uh, for example, you know, with the vaccine, you can try to falsify it using placebo injections. Yeah, so I, I thought the way to you would demonstrate falsifiability is to demonstrate that there's another principle of learning that happens that does explain what's going on in those situations that reinforcement would doesn't work. So for example, you have the Pavlovian conditioning where you make an, um, an association between, um, you know, a light, let's say a bell and, a, and food, and it happens regardless of what behavior they're doing, they will change their behavior to start doing um, anticipatory behaviors at the bell, even when food is absent, if you pair the, the bell and the food enough times. So that looks a lot like pairing a lever in food in the rat. You can teach which lever to press in a rat by Pavlovian conditioning. So why do you need reinforcement at all if everything that you can find in the learning repertoire can be demonstrated by the simpler Pavlovian process of just having two stimuli happen within a time window? It, there's no, there's no requirement of a behavior happening that needed to be reinforced. So I that's like the control you, group. So what happens when you bring up positive reinforcement to other professors? I mean, where, where does it go? Does it lead anywhere? It's so steeped in the culture that they, they don't even want to consider it. Um, it's, it's like if you had said that there's no such thing as plate tectonics now, that continents are, are firm, stuck in where they're at. So it'd be like, you know, there's so much evidence for this. Why would I even consider that you have another um, opinion about it? Because that is obviously false. Um, so that's, that's what the problem is really, is that it's, it's so easy a concept to grasp, but so hard a concept to say that we don't have the control groups to demonstrate it, there's circular logic, there's still these problems, why can't we come up with something better? And usually that's that's where the conversation ends and they're like, yeah, there's problems, but we'll figure it out. I know that um, Noam Chomsky has said uh, positive reinforcement theory just won't die. Every, time, <laughs> every, time, every time it gets knocked down, it comes back again um, at some point. And, you know, uh, there was a linguistics professor who said that when she teaches her introductory class, she asks the students how children acquire their language. And nearly 100% say it's through positive reinforcement and association. And, um, you know, even after I have done some research and read a little bit about this, it's hard for me to get away from it. For example, you know, I might see a, um, a bird come into my backyard uh, who, you know, sees food there, a certain spot, mm -hmm. and it will come back again looking for the food. And it's natural for me to, to think like, oh, positive reinforcement. Yeah, so, so place conditioning is, is uh, explicitly a Pavlovian process. Like if you look it up, people will admit that um, 
having food in a specific location and then the animal learning that location is a, you know, uh, an association between a location and the food, which is not require a requirement of the response to get there. So they could get there any number of ways. So the response might always be different, but they always know where that food is, right? So again, you're not reinforcing a specific behavior, but learning a concept of where where food is. And you're not calling into question um, Pavlovian conditioning. Oh no, 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 like that's easily demonstrable. You can you can demonstrate with control groups that the stimulus that was paired with food, let's say bell and food, that gets an association and you get a change in behavior. Where another stimulus that happens irrespective of the food, they don't have that change in behavior. So the control group is unpaired stimulus versus paired stimulus. So paired is bell, food, bell, food. Unpaired is, well, just happens wherever. So the probably the most common example I see given of positive reinforcement, um, often in like intro to psychology textbooks, it would be... Um, that people go to work for a paycheck. Yeah, well, have you ever received a, um, a hiring bonus that came to your door before it, before uh, you started your work? Or do you know people have gotten that? Yeah. So uh, if that were true, why wouldn't that inhibit the people showing up to work? Because you're getting paid for nothing to have a, a bonus that shows up before you start work. And so it should reinforce nothing? It should reinforce nothing. Or it should reinforce whatever other job you were doing. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, we've been talking a little bit about rat studies. Um, when I think about rat studies, I often, depending on what it's about, so like I know Joseph Ledoux studies um, the fear centers in the brain. And obviously, you know, he, he does rat studies. But we humans and rats, you know, share a lot in that area of fear. And so it doesn't seem like that would be, you know, uh, too much of a stretch um, to be, you know, generalizing what he finds in rats um, to humans. But in other times, like with, you know, antidepressants, things like that, it seems a little bit more of a stretch. Um, how informative in general are rats uh, studies? Rats obviously aren't the same as humans. Um, and also, uh, does it make a difference that the rats aren't wild, that they were grown in the lab? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, it's a lot of people have this argument, and I don't know if there's a great answer to it yet, but I know one thing that would help, and that is um, to be able to define the principles that actually do hold across species. And if you only use rats and humans and lab rats and humans, not even wild rats and humans, then you only have this these two data points that you don't ever know whether or not they're gonna line up very well. But if you use, let's say, 10 different species, you'd start seeing patterns of where, where different uh, types of experiments could, could hold across the different species, right? So, so I think it's a problem that we have too few experimental species to try to generalize off of one, one species about what humans do. Where if you had 10 of them, it would be a lot more informative. Still not perfect, because they're all gonna be different, but at least you'd start to see better patterns emerging of what humans are consistent with other animals and what you're not, I think. And so I think that's the trap. And what about the fact that the rats are grown in the lab? Yeah, that's... That's another point. Um, uh, maybe as we get more and more sedentary and stuck in our, our homes, and if there's more COVID types of problems that happen, maybe the, the constrained lab rat would be a better model. But, you know, we're a, we're a social species that um, interacts in a, an enriched world. And so if you have a, a rat that grows up without enrichment in this cage by itself, maybe with one other buddy, you're, you're going to have some differences show up for sure than what you would see with a, a wild population. Um, for example, uh, 
tame lab rats, the lab rats in the uh, in the experiments are much more likely to um, look into novelty. They're going to interact with novel objects than a wild rat. You put something new in the wild rat's home, it won't touch it. It like simply will avoid it. And I think uh, some of the novelty experiments have the problem of like, well, that's not really what wild rats do. It's what, you know, lab rats do. To say more about the enrichment studies. Um, wasn't there an interesting study about rats and cocaine and, and what, what can that teach us, if anything, about humans and cocaine or anything else? Yeah, there was a whole interesting uh, series of experiments from Alberta. Uh, I believe it was Alberta um, that uh, demonstrated that when you give rats enrichment, um, and that's social enrichment, these interesting tubes and and dirt to play in and all this, that they won't do drugs at all. <laughs> like they they just don't get addicted. They won't touch cocaine. I don't think they even drank alcohol is a completely different outcome from the, the poor lab rat that that's all they have to look at is the, the lever with the cocaine attached to it. You know, it's, it's just amazing. And, and I think that might say a little bit about humans. Um, it does seem like the better the enriched life, the less likely you will do drugs. Um, but I, I think it's really hard to, to give a full one-to-one -one lab rat drug study to human drug study because of that. What was the point of the study? Why did it make such an impact? Um, I don't know what the original um, reason for doing it was, but I, I bet it was something to do with uh, the, re the researchers looking at the, at the studies and saying like, this isn't what normal rats act like. Because as soon as you start doing interesting things, you get a whole repertoire of rat behavior that you don't see in a box. So there could be kind of a, a general um, principle that that of what we're talking about of the applicability, yeah. Of relevance. Okay. I I would love to see more um, learning studies conducted in these enriched environments um, because you'd see a, a completely new world or, around rat behavior and learning when they get their full stimulation, right? But that that's harder to to accomplish because. Um, it's harder to control the situation well when you have so much going on. So I think the reason that most people do this minimalistic rat in a box study is because you can take away all those other variables. But maybe the other variables were important to the principle of learning. In uh, Jordan Peterson's book, he tells a story of the lobster study where lobsters were given antidepressants and the antidepressants supposedly worked on them. Peterson <laughs> says that the, uh, that the serotonin system mediates dominance and submission in lobsters, just like it does in people. Um, and a, a low ser serotonin lobster is, you know, crouched down and inhibited, won't fight, it retreats. And a victorious lobster, um, you know, uh, the serotonin levels rise and he acts bigger than he is and struts <laughs> around. Yeah. You know, P Peterson thinks the same is true of humans and that we have a, a dominance hierarchy, which is evolutionary and is mediated by serotonin. Does this comparison to lobsters um, sound reasonable? I think it does, actually. And I, I think it does speak to the fact that we need more um, species in our comparisons. So, like, who would have guessed that if uh, all you did was rat studies? That, that'd be hard to fathom, right? Um I, I know from some of my insect, insect work that their serotonin does mediate a lot of the same processes as what appear to be the processes in humans at a simpler level. So I would love to see more of this, you know, social invertebrate studies to see, you know, what, what are the principles of social hierarchies and is it always mediated by the same molecules? Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, I bet. It's common to hear neuroscientists like uh, Sam Harris talk about how free will doesn't exist. Um, they often point to the famous Labette experiment. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the Labette study showed that um, there's activity in your motor reflex prior to you taking a willed action, such as you lifting your finger. And this, 
you know, calls into question whether you would have free will if you think that when you lift your finger, that's, you know, when you've made the decision. But if there's activity that came in before you did it, it seems like that decision was made already when you just, when you actually did the action of lifting your finger. Well, yeah, what does that tell a, you about? Yeah. That's a really interesting study. Um, another problem though, is what are the control groups? Did they, did they do the right control groups? So later on, some other people continued this research and found that um, if you have a choice between two pictures and you had to choose the right picture to touch, I think um, that, you know, the implication was that your decision was made with this potential that went up before. And that showed that you already made your decision and then you don't know about it until later. Well, it turns out if you have two choices there, um, that potential actually happens before the choices arrive to make the choice. So it starts to go up and then the, the, the potential in your brain starts to go up, then the pictures appear, then you make the choice. So whatever that potential is, it's not necessarily about the decision-making process specifically because it happened too soon before the decision was available. So it very well may not tell us anything about free will. Might not tell us anything about free will. But I, I would argue something else here. Um, does it does it really matter whether we have free will if we're so complex you can't really tell? So interesting I, point. I, I'm wondering, like, okay, so if you can't tell the difference because it's so complex that it, you could have free will or you just could have so many variables that you could never pin them down to why you make that decision. Um, it's really in practice, it's not much different, right? I, I'd say it, it wouldn't matter to you unless you tried to find out the answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, unless you really cared whether it was well, true. Well, yeah, because if you found out the answer and you found out you didn't have free will, I would say that does matter. But if you just said, I'm just not going to look into it, I'm going to go <laughs> I'm gonna go about my life, then yeah. I would say, yeah, that, and that might be wise. Noam Chomsky says that this study tells us absolutely nothing um, about the freedom of the will except yeah. that choices are probably unconscious. Um, and he said that, but we already knew that without the experiments. <laughs> um, it sounds yeah. like what Chomsky's saying is that as long as you're making decisions, even if they're unconscious decisions, um, you still have free will. But what would it look like to not make a, a decision? Uh, or, or, or what would it look like to make an unconscious decision that sounds like an oxymoron yeah so your brain makes a decision but you don't know it did it <laughs> yeah i mean that's kind of weird to call that a decision i guess yeah yeah i guess people think of decisions as a conscious process so so then what would determinism be yeah yeah i don't think i have an answer for that um it one... seems like the, it seems like he's calling determinism free will maybe um, and, and by the way, I couldn't, I couldn't get a straight answer on him when I asked. <laughs> when I, I said, okay, so then what's determinism? And I, I, I didn't get a straight answer. So yeah. Okay. Continuing with Chomsky, he told me a long time ago that he thinks it's clear that most of our mental life is um, unconscious and not accessible to us. Um, he says that neuroscientists can't even figure out how you lift your arm yet confident psychologists think they can explain, for example, how we make complex decisions. Um, is Chomsky making a category error here, confusing the neurological level with the psychological level? Yeah, I, th I think so in, in one respect, and that's uh, what's demonstrable by experiment. So you don't necessarily have to understand all of the parts below um, to be able to tell how a decision is made. And let me get a, give an example. So you'll, you'll get at least part of the mechanism if you can make an experiment that can rule out different possibilities. So have you, uh, are you familiar with a sign stimulus? No. Um, so this is a, a stimulus that no matter where it is in the world or how it looks, it will get a specific type of reaction from a specific species. So the, the famous experiment was with 
herring gulls, where um, the chicks will peck at a red circle. On the, on the bill of the mama um, herring gull, there is a red spot, and that's what activates pecking to get food. So it turns out that no matter how you do this, um, if you have a red spot, an even unrealistic red spot, huge red spot, it will elicit pecking. So you know that somewhere in the brain, there is a decision, a decision that says, when red spot, peck. Peck at red spot. But we don't know all the, the components that go on underneath that. But we can, through the experiment, say that, yes, it's actually the red. Yes, it's actually the spot itself that elicits this behavior that creates this decision. So none of the molecular work has to be done, any of the other part, but we do know why they made that decision to peck. Very, very simple situation here. So I think that can be extended to complex decision making too, where you can see the algorithm, so to speak, the process that happens of why the decision is made. Is it a Pavlovian conditioning? Is it a reinforcement? Is it something else that we need to define through the behavior experiment that we can do? Now that's a little separate from all the components that go underneath where you can look at the, um, the molecular and the cellular pathways and all these things that can lead up to why you actually made the peck. So there's different levels of understanding, but you still can get something out of the behavior that proves a principle and an understanding of decisions. How are you involving uh, neuroscience with AI now, now in your company? Yeah, back to, back to free will, right? Um, so so I, what I did was um, I started taking the research I was doing on um, learning and memory and the molecular work that I'd done and putting that into algorithms to make robots smarter. So I had developed a learning algorithm based on molecular networks. I developed emotional systems that were underlying the behaviors. And I developed personality types that were modeled after the hormones that float around in the body. Um, so I took the stance that it doesn't matter whether there's free will or not, you can create a system that's sufficiently complex to be able to demonstrate something that looks like free will and it will be entertaining and exciting for people to see. I wanted to build a real, you know, R2-D2 from Star Wars, kit from Knight Rider. And I said the typical AI doesn't cut it. We need to use neuroscience. So that was the premise. So I mean, we know so little about the brain. Um, how can you make any real like meaningful contributions to AI based on neuroscience? Yeah, I get that every single time I, I've, <laughs> I've asked that question. Um, the, the truth is we do know quite a bit about the principles underlying the brain. So you don't necessarily, like, like I said with the last question with the, the goal, you don't necessarily need to know exactly down to the molecule how all these work, all these processes work, but you can develop principles and then try to mimic those overarching principles in software. So there's a principle of Pavlovian conditioning where if you put two stimuli together, they change the behavior in a certain way. So you can model that a little bit in software where you don't literally have the same brain components, but you can see the process of Pavlovian conditioning appear in the behavior of the robot. So it's not a one-to-one -one need to know everything about it you need to know just enough about the brain to understand the principles underlying intelligence. And I found that reinforcement wasn't one of those, positive reinforcement wasn't one of those principles. And so I can't use that in my algorithm. And now your AI, is it based on uh, just humans? Oh, absolutely not. Um, there, there's another problem. Humans, there's even less known about because we're so inaccessible, right? How many people are going to let you really dig in and, and get every piece of information out of them? Can't do anything invasive. And like you're saying, um, a lot of what we talk about 
what we think is going on in our brain is biased compared to what may actually be happening. So I started at the bottom. It's like, what's the simplest organism that learns? And it looks like that you can actually get learning Pavlovian conditioning within single cells. So there's a molecular network that can account for Pavlovian conditioning. And then once you part, start putting these cells together in groups, then you can start getting some of these hierarchical behaviors, some of these emergent properties. So start low, look at things from single cells to fruit flies, rat behavior, octopus, lobster, whatever you can come across, see what the similarities and what the differences are and make principles. And what, is, what do you see as the ultimate goal? Uh, the ultimate goal would be to make something that could actually be a companion, uh, a friend, like, like uh, at first maybe a pet, maybe a, a comrade in, in your life later. So um, what if you could have a, a game character that was lifelike enough that you could have an adventure with it? in a video game and it wasn't a real person it was a it was a what's called a non-player character a, an ai what if your roomba could really turn into rosie from the jetsons you know that, and, that's and you goal. you have an advantage over others who are trying this as well because you're of the way you're doing it differently yeah if you want something that's lifelike why not look at life as an inspiration and I know some people have tried this as a opposed bit. to like computers, the, yeah. like, like looking at uh, through like computer programming. Yeah. So computers do things very differently from human brains. They're very good at statistics and big calculations, getting tons of data. We're very good at making snap decisions from almost no experience. Um, you know, working in an unstructured environment where who knows what's going to happen. Computers don't deal with that very well. Give me more description of, you know, if you're trying to make a character uh, the way you're doing it, what would set it apart um, from somebody doing it uh, through AI? Yeah, so, so AI is missing some of those fundamental components of what, what's life. And one of them is the emotional systems that color the way that we interact with the world. So you want to have something that, that can feel itself the way that maybe eventually a human feels, but, you know, what if you got something that could feel the way a rat feels at least? And, you know, they have fears, they have friends, they have love interests. And so I model those emotional systems. And, and when you see the behaviors that come out of that, that's what brings this to a more lifelike, interesting interaction. Where can people find you? What do you want to plug? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm in Tahoe. Um, you can uh, I've been I've been just active on LinkedIn lately, um, talking about uh, autonomous robots and and other technology things at the moment. Um, I'm uh, possibly going to start a company soon called NeuralWorkshop.com. So that's where the next evolution of this is going to go. So look up neuralworkshop.com. Awesome. Thanks, Gunnar. So yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been exciting. So I, I love chatting about this kind of stuff. Me too.